Hello and welcome to Super Great Kids Stories, wise tales from around the world, which will make you laugh and sometimes cry. Recommended from ages 5 to 105. I'm Kim and I love stories. Hello Super Great Kids and how are you? This is the second of two stories this week. This bonus story is a little gift because we're celebrating having posted a hundred super great kids stories on our podcast. This story is about a giant and King Arthur. King Arthur is a legendary king. Storytellers have been telling stories about him and his knights and the wizard Merlin for many hundreds of years. But before we hear that story, since this story has kings and a castle in it, I wonder if you can think of any words connected with kings and castles to give you some clues. Words like turret or moat. And for kings, you could have crown or cape. See if you can think of any other castle or king words while we have a quick word with the grown ups. Hello, super great kids. I wonder how many king or castle words you could think of. Did you think of tower or drawbridge or crenellations? And with kings, did you think of crown or scepter or jewels? Lots of exciting words there. Now, back to our story. The story today is told by Wilf Mertens and it's a story partly from England and partly from Wales. Those are two countries right next door to each other. Are you sitting comfortably? Am I sitting comfortably? Then let the story begin. Here's Wilf Mertens. Hello again, super great kids. Today I'm going to be telling you a King Arthur story. Now, has anyone heard of King Arthur? OK. And can anyone remember a famous thing that King Arthur did? That's right. He pulled the sword from the stone and became King of Britain. But that happened when King Arthur was just a little boy. And the story I'm going to tell you happened when he was an old man. And it goes something like this. A long, long time ago, there was a king. His name wasn't Arthur. In fact, do you know what? I can't remember what his name was, and I'm just going to call him King One, because he's not in the story for very long. And this King One, he had a rival, whose name I also can't remember, and so I'll just call him King Two, because he was also a king. And King One and King Two, they were frenemies. A frenemy is someone who you pretend is your friend, but actually they're your enemy. And King One and King Two were walking around King Two's kingdom. And they were having a kind of frenemy-style argument where they were pretending they were having a nice chat. But actually, it was a competition and an argument. And King One was saying to King Two, Oh, I do like your fields. They're, they're so nice and small. My fields are so large and unmanageable. King Two didn't like the sound of this. And he said, Yes, that's maybe, but... The sheep in your fields, they're really rather scrawny and pathetic, whereas my sheep are lovely and white and fluffy like clouds. Hmm, said King One. Yes, well, that's as maybe, but up there, and he pointed at the real clouds sailing above in the sky, those are my real sheep, you see. Look how big and white and fluffy they are. King Two said, they're not your sheep, they're the clouds. That's silly. You don't own those sheep. He said, I do, they're all my sheep. And there's their shepherdess. And the moon had just risen. He pointed to her. She works for me. Look at her beautiful silver cheeks. King Two was really upset about this. And he said, well, actually, all of the fields that your sheep are grazing in belong to me. King One said, what do you mean? You mean the sky? Yes, I mean the sky belong to me. And so you owe me rent. If your sheep are going to be roaming across my fields, then you should be paying me rent. I'm not going to pay you rent. That's ridiculous ridiculous. You're the only one who's ridiculous around here. And the two of them 
they started to roll around in the mud and fight one another. Now, had they not been kings, the matter could have ended there, but I'm afraid they were kings. And kings have armies, and so their armies were called, and there was a great battle, and the sky went dark with arrows, and there was the clinking of swords, and the screaming of men at war. And all of this noise, it woke up a nearby giant. The giant had been sleeping under a mountainside, and he had only been asleep for about a thousand years, and he was just getting into it, when some horrible noise of a battle woke him up. And so he stretched and he got up and he surveyed this battle. He could see all the people fighting and he knew about these battles. Normally the kings were the ones who were making it happen. And he, he found the kings partly due to their crowns, but also because in these days, the kings all liked to have these really, really long beards. They liked their beards to be really, really long, so they tickled their toes as they walked, and they felt these beards made them look very, very wise. And so, finding the, the ones with the longest beards, the giant knew he had picked out the kings, and he picked up King Two and King One, and he held them up to his face, and he said, Now what's this all about? And King One pointed at King Two and he said he owns the sky and I have to pay him rent. And King Two pointed at King One. He said that the clouds were his sheep and, and, and they were grazing on my fields for free. And, and, and the giant shook his head, you silly kings. Nobody owns the sky. That's ridiculous. Now I'm going to teach you a lesson. And here's what the giant did to teach the kings a lesson to teach them some humility and meekness, he snipped off their beards because he knew they were very proud of their beards. And that was their punishment. And he told them to stop the battle. And they called off their troops and the battle was stopped. And it would have been good if the matter had ended there. But in those days, the land was full of kings. There were kings everywhere. You would probably be a king. Does anyone here think they're a king? Where's your kingdom? Is it your bedroom? Is it your house? Or do you think you're the rightful king of the whole land? Well, that's what most of the kings back in these times thought. And they were constantly squabbling with each other and fighting. And when they heard that King One and King Two had fought one another over who owned the sky, well, then they all started getting involved as well. And so it happened that King Three started a war with King Four because he said that his grandfather had left him the sky in his will and it belonged to him. But King Four said that because he lived on the tallest mountain and his castle was on the tallest mountain of any of the kings, then he was closest to the sky and that meant he was the one who owned the sky. And so they went to war and the poor giant was just getting to sleep again under his mountain. He was woken by the sound of a battle. And once again, he found the two kings with their long beards and once again, he snipped them off to teach them a lesson. And like this, King Five and King Six and King Seven and King Eight and many, many kings went to battle. And at the end of it, the giant had a big pile of king's beards. And he thought to himself, what am I going to do with these king's beards? And then he had a bright idea he decided to weave them, weave them into cloth. And out of this cloth, he made a cloak, a cape. It was a wonderful thing. And the giant, well, he went to a big moot of other giants. He met up with the other giants to discuss their giant business. And he showed them his king's beard cape. Oh, it's nice, isn't it? 100% king's beard it is. Oh, no one's got a nicer cloak than me. All the other giants, well, they had to admit, the cloak was rather impressive. But then one of them noticed, Oh, what's that? And indeed, he pointed down to a corner of the cape and there was a little hole. Oh no, there's a hole in my cape. How am I going to fix that? I need another king's beard. But all the kings were now clean shaven. There was no more king's beards around. He couldn't get a king's beard for love nor money. Well, the giant kept asking around. And eventually he spoke to a rather handsome storyteller called Wilf. And this storyteller, Wilf, 
knew there was a king that hadn't got involved in any of the wars, right down in Tintagel. And his name was King Arthur, and he was really famous back in the day. And um, he didn't get into as many adventures as he used to. He had kind of retired, and he was living a quiet life down there. But nonetheless, he had a great big impressive beard that would be just the thing to uh, fix the giant's cape. And so the giant was overjoyed to hear this and started stomping down towards Tintagel to go and see if he could get this beard off King Arthur. But the storyteller, Wilf, you know, he was friends with King Arthur, and so he ran on ahead to warn King Arthur that the giant was coming for him. Now, he found King Arthur in the castle of Tintagel and all the knights of the round table, but all of them were looking like they were getting on a bit, and they were quite old, and none of them really looked capable of fighting a giant. But nonetheless, the storyteller, he told King Arthur about what was going to happen. And King Arthur thought about it. And he said, well, it's very good you've come to me, Wilf. Thank you for telling me this. Don't worry. Leave it with me. I'm going to sort this. But I need you to do something for me to help me protect this beard of mine. And he whispered a few instructions in to Wilf's ear. And so, and then you get it. Then you tell him. And then it's, okay. And soon the giant, who was trying to still make his way down to Tintagel, he saw Wilf coming towards him. And Wilf said, Hey, Mr. Giant, sir, I thought I would help you because you know this King Arthur. Surely you've heard of his reputation. He's really rather fearsome. And his knights of the round table, they're a terrifying bunch. So I wouldn't want you to get into any trouble. So um, please, just take me with you and I'll give you any advice as you're going to collect your final beard. So it was that the giant picked up Wilf and put him on his shoulder and kept stomping on down towards Tintagel. And when they got quite close to the castle, close enough to see it on the horizon anyway, the giant noticed that there were lots of bright, shining lights from the top of the castle. Oh, what are all those bright, shining lights? asked the giant. Oh, said Wilf, I know the answer to this. That is the eyes of the knights of the round table. They're glowing, because before a battle they glow. Well, why do they glow? Well, they glow because Merlin the wizard gives them all a magic potion that makes them fearsome fighters and then makes their eyes glow as a kind of side effect. And then that's how you know they're about to fight a battle. Oh, well, that's a bit scary, said the giant. But nevertheless, he had come to get the beard, and so he stomped onwards. And as he got a bit closer, he could smell something in the air. It was a lovely, sweet smell. Oh, it's like honey. It was a smell so sweet that it would have turned a wild swan tame. And if a tame swan had smelled it, it would have turned them wild. That was how magical this smell was. What's that smell? asked the giant. Oh, I know the answer to this, replied Will. That's the smell of the magic potion that Merlin Let's the knights of the round table drink before they have a battle. Oh, that's a bit scary. It smells like a very strong potion. But nevertheless, he had come all of this way, and so the giant plucked up his courage and he kept stomping towards Tintagel Castle. And as he got closer, he heard a terrible racket, a sound like lightning and thunder. Oh, what's that sound? Oh, I know the answer to this, said Will. That's the sound of the hooves of the horses, the steeds of the knights of the round table, and they're beating against the cobblestones because the horses themselves are so brave, they just can't wait to run into battle, even when they're fighting a fearsome giant. And by now, the giant was feeling really rather scared, and he was beginning to quake. And Wilf said, Mr. Giant, sir, maybe it's best that instead of fighting them head on, we try a sneak attack. There's a valley just here, and if you crawl down on your hands and knees, you could crawl through the valley, and then you could um, get round the back of Tintagel Castle, and you could take them by surprise. So it was that the giant got down on his hands and knees, and he crawled through the valley. And then he heard a voice up at the top of the valley counting. It counted from three to one. Can you do that? Three, two, one. And he looked up to see 
many little hands holding a great big net, and they threw that net as soon as the voice said one, and it Wrapped itself around the giant, and though he struggled and though he fought, he was stuck in this net. And it was then that old King Arthur appeared. And he climbed up on the giant's chest, and he looked down into the giant's eyes. And he said to him, Mr. Giant, I know you were told that you were going to be fighting the Knights of the Round Table, but I've got news for you. They're all asleep around the round table, having had a nice big Sunday lunch. They're having their afternoon nap. And who you were really facing was just the people of Tintagel. The bright lights that you saw shining from the top of the castle. They were just the people of Tintagel holding up mirrors and reflecting the light of the sun into your eyes. And the smell you could smell? That was no magic potion, I'm afraid. That was just the smell of the honey wine, the mead, that the people of Tintagel insist on drinking. And the sound you could hear, that wasn't the hooves of the trusty steeds of the Knights of the Round Table. Rather, that was just the people of Tintagel banging pots and pans and making the biggest racket that they could, something that they loved to do. Having revealed all this to the giant, King Arthur continued, Now. We tricked you and we've captured you here in this net. But, Mr. Giant, sir, you've come all this way to get yourself a beard. And although I don't want to part with my marvellous beard, I wouldn't want you to go home empty-handed. And so let me help you with that. And with that, King Arthur pulled out Excalibur, his famous sword, from its hilt, and he took hold of the giant's beard, and he sliced it carefully off with his sword, and with that he cut through the net that was binding the giant, and so the giant could once again stand up, and King Arthur handed him his own beard. And sure enough, the giant took it from King Arthur, and he bowed, and he stomped off back to Wales. And you know what? When he got home to his mountain, he did put that beard into his king's beard cape. He wove it in and so the cape was complete and he would still wear his king's beard cape. He would wear it to every meeting of the giants and whenever he wanted to wear a special bit of clothing and it was always his favourite. But do you know every time he put it on, he remembered that there was one king of all the kings that he couldn't defeat, and that was King Arthur of Tintagel. The End Ooh, thanks to Will for that story. I loved the way the giant said, You silly kings! I wonder if you'd rather be a king or a giant. I suppose kings have lots of power and lots of money, but giants, huh, they can stride across half a country in a couple of steps. Try asking your grown-up what they'd rather be. Thanks very much for listening to that story, and thanks especially to all our listeners in California. Now, we do love hearing from you. And lots of you have been getting in touch with your pictures and reviews and subscriptions. So it's time to dig deep into our bag of happies and say some more thank yous. A very big thanks to all of you who've been supporting us on Apple and Patreon and Ko-fi. Thanks very much to new Patreon members Robin and Cora and Jody, who are from Sebastopol in California. And thanks to Sarah Jane and Thora, who is seven, and Elwood, who is five, from Devon. And hello to new Apple subscriber Olivia from Cripple Creek in Virginia. Welcome to the Super Great Kids family. And thanks for donations to Kofi, to JJ and baby brother Ada from Ireland, and to Caden, who is seven, from the US, and who likes listening to Super Great Kids stories before bed. 
We rely on your donations and subscriptions to keep producing Super Great Kids stories and to help pay our storytellers. If you'd like to support us, you can give a one-off payment on ko-fi.com forward slash Super Great Kids stories or for bonus stories and early access, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on Patreon, which you'll find on our website at supergreatkidsstories.com. We've had some very thoughtful reviews too. So thanks to Olivia from Cripple Creek in Virginia and to Capria and to Michelle in the United States. And now, time to say thank you to some more of you who've been sending in your beautiful drawings inspired by Super Great Kids stories. Thanks to Ike from Oregon, who sent a funny picture of the how and why story, Why Crocodiles Sleep With Their Mouths Open. Thanks, Ike. I really like your crocodile with a huge mouth filled with teeth and the tiny mean eye. I wonder if you could tell your brother Pedro a how and why story which you made up. And thanks to siblings Max and Angus. Max, I really like the way you've set your picture of why the whale has a sad song with the huge purple mountains and the poor stuck whale to show just how stuck he is. And Angus, I love your scary woods for the setting of the Irish story Eggshell Soup. It feels very dark and mysterious with the dark brown of the trees and the earth and the dark sky and the orangey sun. Really creepy. Thank you. And Kashvi, who is seven, has sent us an illustrated story which she's written about a pony and a unicorn. I like your illustrations of the pony and glittercorn. Good name. And I like the way they're dotted around the page and they're all talking to each other. I wonder if you can tell your story to someone at home, Kashvi. And Sheldon, who is five, has sent an energetic picture of the boy holding his seed from the story The Seed. I really like the fact he's wearing a crown on his head because it shows you he's going to be the next king. I wonder what kind of plant you would grow if you were taking part in a growing competition. And six-year-old Adam from Glasgow has drawn a very cleverly planned picture of the story from Jamaica, Nora and the Aki Fruit. I really like the way the water is divided from the land, which shows the feeling Nora has of being cut off from the other side of the river. Really good, Adam. Thanks for sharing it. And Cassandra, who is six, and her brother Chester, who is four, like listening to super great kids' stories on their way to school. Cassandra has drawn a marvellous picture of Pip and the Moon Rabbit story. I like the way the white rabbit is perched on the moon and looks rather wonderful and strange. Well, just as the rabbit is in Pip and the Moon Rabbit story. Thanks very much for sending this, Cassandra. It's super great. And Ruby, who is six from Austin in Texas, has sent us a fun picture of eggshell soup and she's playfully presented it as a sort of present to unwrap. I really like your pan full of eggshells and your colourful whiskey bottle and pipe for the backy. Really good, Ruby. It's a bit like a story map. I wonder if you can tell the story. And eight-year-old Rosalie from Seattle in Washington has drawn a magical picture of the Baba Yaga story. I love the way you've shaded the night sky diagonally and the ground with two shades of green horizontally. It really adds texture to the story and makes Russia feel somehow huge, which it is. And June, who is four, from Albany in California, has sent us a delicately coloured unicorn picture. Her favourite stories are The Wishing Feet and The Spinning Sisters. Thanks very much, June, for sharing this. I particularly like the pink hair and the purple and blue horn. And six-year-old Remy from Dublin in Ireland has drawn a lovely picture of the lonely giant under the sea with his friend the Welsh whale offering to help him. And I rather like your shark, or is it a killer whale, in the background. Lovely. Hello to Shay too. Glad you're both enjoying the stories. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening and thanks for all your pictures and messages. Remember, there's another bonus story if you haven't already heard the Baba Yaga story this week. Bye for now. This Super Great Kids podcast was produced in Wardour Studios in London. 